So, this will be our splinting mod part, portion of the module. Um, this PowerPoint will have uh, videos embedded into it. Um, there will be a much larger file. If you'd like the smaller file without the videos embedded, there is a separate, there should be a separate uh, link for that. So, today, or now, or however you're doing this, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of splints. Then the indications, the equipment, and complications that you should always know. We'll talk about a few points about billing, and then uh, some tips, as well as uh, videos. So there will be videos in this um, mini lecture here, which makes the mini lecture much longer. But with uh, you can you should be able to skip over the videos if you can just skip to the next slide. Uh, also, though, you can uh, link to the videos from the separate document, or you can search them yourself on YouTube. So there was evidence of rudimentary splints uh, as early as 500 BC. Now, you know, we've really abandoned circumferential casts in the emergency department. They just have too many complications. They're too hard to apply, while uh, splints are so much easier, and they allow for swelling as well, which we know in the acute setting is going to happen. Indications. Uh, we know fractures, uh, but also sprains. Uh, some joint infections can be helped with uh, splint to prevent you from moving around a whole lot. Uh, tenosynovitis can be helped as well as acute arthritis or gout. Uh, lacerations over joints. This one can be a little counterintuitive, but um, you, when you place those sutures, you don't necessarily want them, you know, moving the elbow around if it's on like the back of the elbow or something. Uh, so by placing a splint on there they can, that they can take on and off, uh, it allows them to uh, not disrupt your suture repair as much. Um, puncture wounds and animal bites of the hands and feet are another one. Um, you know, there's a procedure for in the wilderness uh, when you've gotten a, uh, a snake bite uh, to do a compression splint uh, to help prevent the uh, spread of the venom. So plaster of Paris was the typical uh, product used for this for a long time. It's made from gypsum. It is fast. Uh, the fast drying uh, plaster of Paris sets in about five to eight minutes. The extra fast drying is two to four minutes, um, but obviously it gives you a little less time to mold. It can take uh, take up to one day to cure, which is reaching its maximum strength. For the upper extremities, you want to use plaster. If you're going to use plaster, you want to use eight to ten layers or so. For the lower extremities, you really want to use much more. You want to use 12 to 15. I would definitely recommend 15. You can even up to 20 if it's a big person. Um, the more you use, though, the higher the risk of a burn. This is an exothermic reaction when you get it wet, the same way that uh, fiberglass is. So you want to be a little bit careful of that. Um, plaster Paris you should be using for um, AO splints or splints of the lower extremity uh, combination stirrup and posterior of the ankle, um, just because the Fiberglass products are really not strong enough uh, for that. So, the ready made splinting material, such as uh, plaster in that brand, it would be OCL. And it's 10 to 20 sheets of plaster with padding and a cloth cover. Uh, for fiberglass, the brand we're familiar with is Ortho Glass. It cures uh, very rapidly, uh, about 20 minutes. It gets to its maximum strength. It's much less messy, it's stronger, lighter wicks moisture better, less moldable though. Um, but the big thing is that um, for lower extremity it's just likely going to be not quite strong enough for those big muscles of the calf, so that's where plaster would be much better. You know, it throws a stockinette on there, um, that's nice. Uh, it can protect the skin, it can also help uh, with the appearance when you're done, which is always good. Uh, you want to cut that longer than the splint, always want to cut yourself some extra and it comes in a whole variety of widths if you can find it depending on your emergency department I know in ours it's very hard to find you can use some padding or web roll um, you're going to do two to three layers and more if you anticipate lots of swelling also you'll use some extra over bony prominences such as elbows and heels and you'd be generous over those uh, always pad between digits which sometimes we forget about um, but even if you can tear off little pieces and throw it between there that'll help with just preventing that macerated skin that happens. Uh, want to avoid wrinkles which can cause uh, wounds in the skin. Uh, don't want to tighten that and avoid circumferential use but that's pretty difficult. 
Hay scraps are a good thing, but just be careful with them. So some complications that we know about. Um, burns is one. Uh, thermal inju injury is the plaster of fiberglass dries. Um, hot water will increase the risk of this, as well as uh, increased number of layers, um, the extra fast drying products, or poor padding. And then with their insignificant pain, you want to remove that splint to cool it down. Um, otherwise, ischemia next to talk about. Um, you know, reduce risk compared to casting, but it's still a possibility. Don't apply the web roll and the ace wraps tightly. And um, you want some close follow-up if you're really worried that this might happen. You know, they can throw ice right on over top of the splint. And uh, when in doubt, you really have to cut that off and look. And remember, pulses will be lost late. And compartment syndrome, which is effectively what you're going to create here, right? You're going to create a compartment syndrome. You're not going to allow for swelling, and that's the whole reason we're doing the splint, as opposed to a cast. Pressure sores, you want to make sure that smooth that web roll and the plaster. And infection, you want to make sure you clean, debride, and dress all wounds before splint application and recheck if a significant wound or increasing pain are obviously for systemic symptoms. So any complaints of worsening pain, take the splint off and look. Again, any complaints of worsening pain, you need to take the splint off and look. So tips. Use the layer of the cotton roll, measure twice, cut once, and allow for extra for those carpenters in our group. Use cold or cool water. This has a couple of advantages. It allows you uh, more time to mold the splint as you'd like. Uh, it also helps prevent burns. Don't get the cotton layer wet if you can avoid it. Now, the, the makers of the uh, um, the combination products, the fiberglass or plaster with the cloth as uh, orthoglass that like we like to use, um, tell you, you know, that you, you, when you're wetting it, you wet right through the cotton. I know our orthopedists and, and uh, a lot of our residents, myself included at times, have taken the uh, fiberglass out of the uh, cotton layer and uh, gotten it wet that way, then put it back in. Um, for whatever reason, the well, the representatives from the companies actually tell you not to do that. I don't know exactly their reasoning, um, but I've heard them say that. So be a little careful with that. But anyway, as long as you don't get the cotton layer too wet, especially the layer that's next to their skin, you should be okay. Don't stretch the ace wrap. That's a very important point. And uh, you really should just be laying that down there enough to hold the splint on. It's not meant for compression, which we, for other things, may use an ace wrap for. It's not meant for compression. So, billing of a splint, a brace, is billed as durable medical equipment. That'd be things like a knee immobilizer or a cock-up wrist splint or something like that. So those um, store-bought braces or uh, manufactured braces are billed as durable medical equipment. You cannot bill uh, physician billing for an off-the-shelf brace or splint because it already includes a fitting and adjustment fee as the durable medical equipment. But for a physician application of a splint, again, this is physician application. You can't bill for somebody else's application, like a tech. Um, there are a few requirements. Uh, CMS says that you must have a twin layer of cotton padding. So if you throw a layer on uh, before with the web roll and then put the, uh, the splint on over top of that with the uh, orthoglass product, that would count. Even just doing the, um, the uh, stockinette underneath the splint would count as two layers. A splint of fiberglass or plaster is required. Uh, an ace wrap, uh, oddly enough, is termed ace wrap if needed, which I'm not sure how you do it without an ace wrap, but whatever. And then the type of splint matters. So the bigger, more complicated splints are going to bill out at a higher level. So make sure you put what type of splint you did. Should be obvious from your chart. So some specific splints and orthoses. Um, just some there, go through some of those. So, long arm posterior splint, indications for elbow and forearm injuries, distal humerus fracture, both bone and forearm, unstable proximal radius or honor fracture, but the sugar tongue is going to be better for that. Um, doesn't completely eliminate supination and pronation, uh, so you need to either add an anterior splint, which you make a call typically a sandwich splint, uh, or use a double sugar tongue if it's a complex or unstable distal forearm fracture. So, uh, the first video is on the next slide. As I said, you can skip over the video here by progressing to the next slide after that. Um, you can get to the YouTube links 
um, that are listed with the video, or you can also just search YouTube for uh, AJ Monceau Splint um, or Emed Sports Stock. My Twitter handle. This is a long arm posterior splint. Thanks to BJ Balsic here. As you can see, we're working from distal to proximal with the web roll. My overlap is about 50%. You notice I uh, made that a little more on the elbow, so we got a little extra coverage there. like to stretch the cotton over top of the fiberglass so you don't get cut by the little pieces of fiberglass there. PJ is doing a great job of holding his arm out there trying not to laugh. Start with the A strap there at the wrist, just gives a nice place to uh, kind of attach to or cinch to. And then uh, once you get around the hand, just start heading down the forearm. Again, not stretching the A strap, just laying it on there, holding the splint on. This is a long arm posterior splint. So we don't need a second version. So a double sugar tong or a reverse sugar tong. There's a couple ways to do this. You can do it as pictured here. We actually use two separate pieces of um, splinting material um, or you can do it as we'll show you in the video. Indications are an elbow and forearm fracture. Uh, proximal, mid, or distal radius and ulnar fracture as well. Um, better for most distal forearm and elbow fractures because it really limits flexion extension and pronation and supination. This is a reverse sugar tong splint, also called a double sugar tong. I always like to start over the thumb there, just to give a nice place to attach to. this we're going to cut a slit about two-thirds of the way across maybe even three-fourths of the way in our splint material the actual fiberglass 
that will allow it to drape over the thumb. See here how we get the splint material wet. Kind of roll that up in a towel to get the water evenly distributed as well as get rid of any excess. Doing this with just one piece of splinting material really makes the procedure much easier, uh, much shorter. It can be done. Um, can do, can be done by yourself, so you have a compliant patient, as Dr. Balsik is here. And starting at the wrist, moving distally, and then kind of starting your way back down the, the forearm once you've covered the end of the splint. Elbow at 90 and the wrist at about 10 degrees. Forearm or volar uh, splint or cock up wrist splint, also called. Soft tissue uh, injuries, hand and wrist, uh, such as sprains, uh, maybe help with this. Uh, most wrist fractures, second through fifth, as well as metacarpal fractures. I most add a dorsal splint for increased stability, also called a sandwich splint, shown in the picture on the right there. Um, it's not used for distal raise or ulnar fractures because you can still supinate and pronate. Uh, previously it had been used sometimes for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, but uh, some recent studies have shown that actually a, a neutral splint is better than a cock-up splint, so you can do obviously do the same uh, splinting material, just instead of uh, you know adding some dorsiflexion to the wrist, I'm going to go ahead and keep that wrist in neutral. This is a volar or cock up wrist splint. So when you're done with the web row as you need it, you can just kind of tear off there as you saw. You always want to stretch that cotton out over the end of the fiberglass.
So forum sugar tongue is also an often used splint. Uh, it's good for distal radius and ulnar fractures as it prevents uh, pronation and supination of the forearm as well as immobilizing the elbow. Uh, the reverse sugar tongue from earlier is a little better at immobilizing the elbow, uh, but this one also does an adequate job. This is a sugar tongue splint. Starting at the thumb, going distally, and then working the way back proximally. Do need to get up over the elbow for this one since the split material is going to be going around the elbow. Very compliant patient there, Dr. Balsic. So the compliant patient can have him help you out, as he did here, he may need an assistant. Um, you can actually have him angle the, the arm downward as well, um, you know, kind of rotating the, uh, the shoulder. You can cut the splint material, or I typically like to go ahead and flap it over like this. That typically makes a little stronger splint and um, you avoid having any of those cut edges which can injure people. I'll provide a little dorsal flexion on the wrist. So, uh, hand splinting, um, you can put it in a position of function, a beer can or wine glass position are often quoted. Uh, obviously, it may have contributed to getting them into this situation uh, with the wrist slightly extended uh, with the fingers kind of flexed. The metacarpal Neck fractures, uh, the MCP at 90 for those, uh, especially those boxer fractures. Uh, you want to have the patient hold an ACE wrap um, or a beer can if still available. And then thumb fractures, you immobilize uh, again as if holding a wine glass. All very intuitive. So, an ulnar and radial gutter. Um, for the ulnar gutter indications, fractures, uh, phalangeal, metacarpal, and soft tissue injuries of the small and ring fingers. And then for a radial gutter, it's fractures, uh, phalangeal, metacarpal, and soft tissue injuries of the index and long fingers. Um, the position shown here of the ulnar gutter is not the correct position. You want them in the intrinsic plus position, uh, which would be the MCP at 90 and the PIP and DIP fully extended. This is an honor gutter splint. So just we gonna be showing an honor gutter here, not the uh, radial gutter, because that's a pretty rarely used splint. As always starting uh, around the thumb to give an anchoring point working distally and then back proximally.
stretching your slip material over the fiberglass to prevent uh, getting cut on the edges of the fiberglass. Get both sides wet, roll it in a towel to distribute the water and dry off any excess. I want your splint material to cover uh, both of those uh, the small and ring fingers. Um, so, for some, you may be able to use 3 inch, for many, you'll need 4 inch splint material. So, again, working distally with that uh, small ace wrap, uh, going between the ring and middle fingers, securing the splint, and then uh, starting to work back down here kind of quickly. Remember for these fiberglass products, uh, you're only going to have a few minutes to really mold this well. That's one of the downfalls of the fiberglass products is that they're less moldable and the longer you wait, you get even worse. So you want to make sure that you're doing your best with that. By using cool water, you give yourself some extra seconds. Once this one is on, you'll put them into the intrinsic plus position. So you want the MCP at 90, and you want the PIP and DIP extended completely. Next, the thumb spica splint. Uh, these are best used for scaphoid fractures, uh, which is uh, seen or suspected. Uh, if any snuff box tenderness, you need to go ahead and throw them in a thumb spica. Uh, also can be used for decrevain stenosynovitis. synovitis. Uh, notching the plaster as shown in the picture to the right helps prevent buckling when wrapping it around the thumb. You want to go ahead and use that wine glass position for this. This is a thumb spica splint. And starting around the thumb, working uh, distally and then back proximally. Soft roll starts to bunch up, you just tear it off so you don't make big creases in it because those can cause skin breakdown. For this one, I'm going to go ahead and cut a couple notches out of the base of the thumb, which will help with the mold a little bit better. Just kind of line that up there. Again, you want to stretch that cotton over the fiberglass so that you don't have any sharp edges sticking out.
with this, you're going to have them take a bit of a wine glass position, as we always say may have gotten them into this mess in the first place. Finger splints, um, pretty straightforward things. Um, the really big thing you have to watch out for with finger splints, uh, number one, you want to go ahead and throw some cotton or web roll down in between the fingers so they don't uh, get emaciated if you're, or macerated, sorry, uh, if you're doing buddy taping. Um, the other type of splinting uses a, a luma foam, is the typical product. And the um, big issue I see there is that uh, when you cut that aluma foam, you really make some very sharp edges. Uh, so many times, um, you know, look at the picture there on the bottom. I'll go ahead and actually use a much longer piece than that. Wrap it around the uh, palmar side of the finger as well, and even down in, extend it down into the palm, um, just to really so I don't have to cut it. They do make different lengths, um, but most emergency departments don't stock the different lengths. They'll just stock the one long length. Uh, for sprains, you know, dynamic or splinting or buddy taping. Uh, for actual fractures, uh, many times you want to go ahead and and do a splint of some type as opposed to the buddy tapering. Posterior ankle splint, uh, indications of distal tibia or fibular fracture, uh, reduced uh, dislocations of the ankle, uh, severe sprains, uh, tarsal or metatarsal fracture. You need to use plaster for this. You want to use it, I would typically go ahead and on the heavy side, 15 layers of the plaster. Um, you can add a coap splint or a stirrup uh, to this, which eliminates inversion and eversion, and it's especially useful for unstable fractures and sprains. So there's a stirrup splint, similar to the posterior splint, or the indications are at least. Uh, you do then help eliminate uh, inversion and eversion, and uh, it's actually get a little less plantar flexion compared to the posterior splint as well. It's great for ankle sprains as well. Um, you want to go ahead and use 15 layers of the four to six inch plaster for this. This is going to cover posterior splints on the lower leg as well as a stirrup splint. Together what we refer to here at West Virginia University as an AO splint. When doing this for real, typically we go ahead and throw some extra web around the heel as well. We'll start with the posterior splint. We're going to stretch our cotton over the top of the fiberglass so that it doesn't cause a skin injury. This may be enough if all you're looking to do is temporary stabilization for transfer or for getting someone to the operating room. Uh, we're going to go ahead and add the stirrup portion of the AO splint just to give a better immobilization. Again, we'll stretch the cotton. Most of the time we would do this with plaster uh, because you want to give a little stronger support because the muscles of the lower leg are so strong that they may break through this fiberglass. Plaster obviously is very messy, um, so for this video we're just going to go ahead and use the ortho glass.
if you're using plaster, you want to use 12 to 15 layers of plaster for each of these portions of the splint. At the end of this, you just want to make sure that their ankle is right about at 90 to avoid a contracture with the Achilles. So, to summarize our splinting tips, you want to use a layer of cotton roll underneath. That provides some nice padding, helps prevent skin injury. Uh, you want to measure twice and cut once and allow extra when you're doing your splinting material. Use cold or cool water to allow yourself more time uh, to mold the splint as well as helping to reduce the risk of burns. Don't get the cotton layer wet when you can avoid it. Um, and finally, don't stretch the ace wrap. Again, don't stretch the ace wrap. That is all.